I have a question for you. What are you looking at? Um, a blurry screen. The library? Let me rephrase the question. Or, or ask two questions, actually. Who's used Google Earth? And the first time you used Google Earth, what did you do? What's the first thing you ever did in Google Earth? Just chat it out. You look for your house, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's generally what everyone does the first time in Google Earth. They look for their house. Or, or depending on their personality, they look for their neighbor's house. But uh, <laughs> we're not going to judge, it's okay. Um, but you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. You know why? Because prior to the 2000s, the number of people that had seen their house from space, their town, their city, even the world from space, was really just a whole bunch of sci-fi geeks and scientists and uh, a small number of cosmonauts and astronauts. And that was it. No one really had that perspective. And now, of course, we grow up kids, they don't know any better. They can view on their phone. It's, quote, normal. And so for me, as you'll find out about my background, that was an amazing revolutionary step. The, world, the fact that the world started looking at our planet in that way. This, by the way, uh, is my house, or at least it used to be my house. This is in the Fairbanks, Alaska, where I used to live. But we'll get to that. Now, I mentioned the early 2000s because that was kind of a benchmark time. And the, and the reason it was a benchmark time is three things came together. The first was really something that had been set in motion in the 1970s with the releases of things like Magnavox Odyssey and the uh, Fairchild Video Entertainment System. You might not recognize those names, but those are actually the first home video consoles. Of course, what you will recognize is the name Atari, an Atari 2600. That's what kicked it off. Well, Atari, they wrote Pong, then they realized, hey, if we make our own consoles, we can uh, get some money out of this. And the whole video game era began. And that's what led to development in this area. Graphics cards for computers. Now, I know such things as having cat videos in high resolution are very important these days, but uh, that's not what drove computer development. It was the gaming industry. So that happened combined with, uh, and, and in the 2000s, graphics cards were becoming uh, you know, very high end. Combined with the fact that in the 2000s, broadband internet got its act together. So, not only did we have powerful computers, we had powerful internet feeds. And then the final piece of the puzzle was the launch of the Iconos and Quickbird satellites. These were the first commercial high-resolution satellites that went up into space. What I mean by high-resolution are images where one pixel on the screen represented meters in real life. So you can really see the detail. In fact, this is one of the uh, I forget whether this is Iconos or Quickbird, but one of the first images ever taken. This is the Sydney Opera House, right here. So all of these things came together and they created an opportunity that was or is Google Earth. The fact was, if it hadn't been Google Earth, it would have been something similar that developed because the time was right. Now, just to back up, uh, I'd like to say thank you for being here today. Thank you, Paul, for the invite to speak. Um, as he mentioned, my name is John Bailey. I am a program manager on the Google Earth uh, Outreach team. So we are a group at Google who uh, we're part of the wider group that does engineering of Google Earth. We actually make Google Earth, as well as a number of other uh, tools at Google, Google Earth Engine, My Maps, and other things. But in the outreach team, our mission is to work with nonprofits, educators, journalists, and others to show them how they can use these tools to make a difference in the world, to do what we call geo for good. My particular specialty is education. Uh, those of you who read my bio, and I'm going to get into this more later, I know that I come from academia. I was actually a college professor uh, until about four and a half years ago. When I quit, and then uh, luckily Google hired me. I quit before I had the job. Don't do that, kids. It's a bad plan. <laughs> uh, but uh, things worked out. And so now, uh, along with a colleague at Google, 
we run the Google Earth Education Program. And we have this mission that we want to leverage Google's geotools, by which we mean Google Earth, Maps, Street View, these other things we're going to talk about, to drive geospatial thinking as a fundamental life and learning skill. Because it really is. Again, I go back to before Google Earth, how many people had seen that perspective on the house, the town, the world. The way we're thinking, the way we're viewing the world has changed. Another question for you. What do these three things have in common? Yes? Are they going to be used to help like the band can be used to Good guess. By the way, do you know what that is, this is? I think you do now, because <laughs> going into the galaxy has really helped me out on this slide the last couple of years. Uh, I used to have to explain that to people. No, they're all products that have become so popular that people just use the brand name to describe the product. Okay, you don't say a personal stereo cassette player already we used to. It was a Walkman, tissue Kleenex, plaster band -aid. That's another good example. And the fact is, Google Earth has kind of become one of these as well. Because Google Earth wasn't the original. There were other what we called virtual globes that were around uh, at the same time and before Google Earth, in fact. And arguably, back in those early days, some of them were better, in some ways, um, than Google Earth. But, you know, Google's the one that became popular and the one that, uh, you know, everybody uses now. There's a few still kicking around. But where it came from is actually in 2001, Google bought a company called Keyhole, who had this technology called EarthViewer. Now, it doesn't look entirely dissimilar, right? You've got the basic globe and the sidebar and navigation controls. But this was what it technically was Google Earth version 1 and then 2. Uh, because when Google bought Keyhole in 2004, repackaged the technology, re-released in 2005, the first version that came out was version 3. And this is what it looked like. Now, if we move forward several years, we went through several versions. Um, you'll know, notice one kind of big change with the Earth. You see how much prettier it got? That's because the world got prettier, right? No, no. There's actually something going on behind the scenes that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute um, once we start looking at Google Earth and looking at some of the imagery. Basically, we at Google became better at serving this technology and serving this imagery. But this is where Google Earth got to. Um, great program, but it's, it's always had some issues. One of which is it's a downloadable application. You have to download and install it. This was a problem in areas like education, where getting permissions for this were awkward. It was also a resources hog. Um, you know, uses up a lot of bandwidth. It had a tendency to crash when it wanted to. Basically, Google Earth closed whenever Google Earth wanted to close. Uh, and, you know, much as we can do to improve these things, the reality is that the technology and the way these programs operated had changed over the years. And so Google, up to about, so I would say after about 2010, 2011, they were running Google Earth, but there wasn't a whole lot of new development going on. And on the Google Earth Outreach team, this was a little concerning because it's in the name, right? So our director, she went to the geo leadership. So the Google Earth group at Google, we fall under an area called geo, which is technically under the project area of search at Google. And she said to them, well, look, if you can give me these resources, we can produce a brand new, wonderful version of Google Earth that I think will sort of re-inspire users. Because people love Google Earth, and, and they still loved Google Earth, even though it was becoming harder and harder to use. So leadership said yes, which was great. And uh, we then spent the next couple of years developing this, 
what we call new Google Earth. Well, by the way, we don't refer to the previous one as old Google Earth, it's classic Google Earth. <laughs> so, uh, but now Google Earth is a web-based application, and this is key. It means uh, a number of things. One, it's in that cloud ecosystem where most of our other applications live. It means that you can download an app on your phone and get the same experience that you would on a desktop. So uh, rather than talking about it, let's actually dive in and take a look at this new Google Earth. And uh, if for any of you who use Google Earth, you immediately saw the difference there, right? It loaded in seconds as opposed to, you know, go away and get a cup of coffee and come back and might have loaded. But other than that, it's sort of the globe that we all know and love. We're, as I mentioned, a lot prettier these days. Now, first thing I want to point out is this sidebar here. This is where the controls are. I want to point out the top three lines. Whenever you see three bars like that on a Google application, it means that if you click it, a sidebar will pop out. And in this case, we're going to use this sidebar to go to Map Start. And the first thing I want to talk about is this map style. The fact that you have a number of different options. So one option is the sort of nice, clean, nothing on there. Another is you have uh, certain artifacts. Or maybe you want everything. And so that if we were to, let's go somewhere that's going to have more infrastructure. Zoom in, roads and everything, you're going to get more labels and things pop up. You can also customize. So one of the things when we first launched that uh, a number of teachers we worked with got upset about was the fact that when you zoom out, clouds are there. They want all the labels and everything, they just don't want the clouds. So we built it in that you can remove the clouds. Now this might seem all very simple, and on the surface it is, but what's important about this is that now that this is in the cloud, these things can all be drawn in different ways depending on where you are physically located. This is a very important point. In the old days of Google Earth, we could never release this program in places like, ironically, India because our borders, our country borders, didn't match up with what they considered borders. Right? If we think through this, it, it makes sense, right? There's a lot of countries around the world, in the Middle East, in Asia, even in places like South America, where there's a lot of disagreement on borders, on names. Uh, you know, I doubt anyone is here from Argentina, but if you were, we could talk about an island off the south coast of Argentina. You would call it Las Malvinas. I would call it the Falkland Islands. The only thing we would agree on is it's only really useful for penguins and sheep. But... Uh, the point is, by having this as a cloud-based system, we can create a different, slightly different version of Google Earth in whatever country you're in. Uh, it also allows us to localize the language. Um, so this, this is a very powerful change. But other stuff hasn't changed so much. Well, I say that, it's actually got better. Let's do a search. So we, we click on the spyglass here to do the search. And I always like to search for this place. Eiffel Tower. Wow. Yeah. That's why I go here, because it gets that reaction. <laughs> and, yeah, normally I talk about Paris, but in fact, since I was just in London, so let's, uh, let's fly over the channel to London. I'm going to zoom down and let's see where are we at. So here's the city of London. There's the Tower of London. I'm just actually going to do a bit of manipulating here and kind of show you the power and how visually appealing this is. <laughs> By the way, all this 3D, 3D buildings you see. This is all automatically generated from the satellite images. Now, we used to own a company called SketchUp, and in the early days of Google Earth, that's how we made buildings at Google Earth. So they had to manually make them. But now, 
there's a way by using satellite images from different views, different angles, that you can auto-generate this. It's a little bit of a cheat, and what I mean by that is, if we were to zoom in, and I guess we could do this, it will start to look not so great. And that's because what's going on here is we're effectively creating a mesh out of triangles. It's the same thing they do in uh, computer gaming technology. And we're mantling that texture over it. And so if you're at a certain, uh, a certain level, it looks awesome. If you get too close, you'll start to see the flaws. Um, but it is, however, really cool. Something that I sort of realized yesterday is Take a look at a building, stare at one building as I do this side-to-side -side motion. You'll notice an effect, look at the tower for example, where it seems to lean over as you pass over. That's called a layover effect. And it's, it's, uh, it's basically analogous to something that happens in real life with satellites. When satellites fly over, they're not all the time going to be looking directly down. And so you get these slightly side views. This is how we're able to extrapolate height information and extrapolate these textures. This, by the way, is the, the monument uh, to the Great Fire of London right here. Uh, a little kind of fact you may or may not know is if you were to take that monument and lie it down, it touches this road here. This road is putting away that's where the baker's shop was that started the Great Fire of London. Mm. Uh, let's see. Let's do one other. I think uh, some of the kids here will appreciate this one. So this is a marketplace called Leadenhall Market. And if we actually just go all the way in here, you may never have heard of it, but you might recognize it. Do you guys recognize this from any movies? Um, Harry Potter. Yeah. That's what you're trying to say, yes. <laughs> this was used for Diagon Alley. It was the inspiration and actually used for some of the filming. All right. uh, you may have noticed while I was doing all that, that there was this thing, a little card popped up in the corner. This is what we call a knowledge card. And if we click on it, we'll get more information because this is connected to what's called the knowledge graph. When you do a search for information on Google and all those sort of facts and figures and links to Wikipedia and other information come up, you've probably never really thought about where that comes from. Well, it comes from this database that we maintain called the knowledge graph. Um, think of it as kind of like our global hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. And the idea behind all this, sorry, I'll go back in there, is that you know we want you to know about those places, but we also want you to explore more. So here we're suggesting other places you can fly to. For example, 30 St. Mary's, which is uh, more commonly known as the Gherkin, because that's what it looks like. <laughs> and so we really want people exploring in New York. That, that, that's one of the main focuses uh, with the, the application. Now it might be that you don't know where you want to explore, so that's why we built in this button here, this little die. If you click on this, this is the I'm feeling lucky button, and it will fly you to a random place in the world. And this is great, because I honestly, you, it's different every time, so I had no idea where that was going to take me. It took me to Boulder's Beach uh, near Cape Town, which is where you go and hang out with penguins. Awesome place if you're ever in Cape Town. But what you can keep doing is clicking this die and you'll go to different places. School kids always like to ask, uh, so, so how, how, how many places are there? Like how, how long before I get to the end? Just tell them to keep clicking. There's 20,000 places, keep them to stay for hours. So. But, uh, so, we're, we're, we're going to talk about some more new features in Earth later, but I, I want to back out now and actually just, uh, since we're talking about the makeup of Google Earth, I want to talk about some, uh, some sort of misconceptions um, about Google Earth.
Google Earth, as maybe you're starting to realize, is actually the realization of long-held ideas and conceptions. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this. This is uh, something called Powers of Ten. It was originally a, a 50s uh, book created by a Dutch educator that was turned into a movie initially in the 60s and then a sort of final cut in the 70s. Uh, the movie's in the, the Library of Congress now. Um, the basic idea is it goes all the way from an atom to a universal view, moving each shot as a power of 10 magnitude. And so it's kind of like when you zoom in on Earth and you get more and more high resolution data, or zoom out and you get a bigger and bigger picture. Now what makes up Earth is a number of data sets, starting with that terrain data. Not the buildings. The buildings are a little bit different. The buildings are sort of extrapolated separate. But if you go and look at mountains, you've got what you call a digital elevation model. And this is made up of a number of data sets. Uh, the base one, though, is something called SRTM, the Shuttle Radar Topographic Mapping Mission. And this was an instrument flown in the uh, space shuttle to effectively map the terrain around the world. It, it sort of misses out on the top bits, um, but it does a pretty good job on the rest of it. It does, however, have its issues. And the issues being that it only sampled, in order to get global coverage in the 10 day mission of the shuttle, it could only sample every so often. And so, when it, on its first pass, you got some uh, errors, if you will. The top image was the original Matterhorn in Google Earth. It became the Matter Hill. <laughs> so we had to kind of do a bit of a fix on some of these places. This is Google Earth now, the Matterhorn, because what we have now are things like LiDAR data. LiDAR is a laser you fly on an aircraft and effectively shoots down and it makes a digital model of the train that way. And it obviously is much, much better resolution. Combined with the better image we have right now, that you think it's a photograph, but it actually is taken from Google Earth. We also have bathymetry in classic Google Earth. We don't have a new Google Earth yet. Bathymetry being the terrain under the ocean surface. Now, of course, on top of that, we need to put our imagery. And we have kind of three main sources for that. We have the satellite imagery, aerial photography in some places, although not so much these days because the satellites are just they're as good as the, uh, the aerial photography, um, much less expensive. And then Street View, which we'll talk about later, which is the ground level 360 imagery. Now I showed you this before. This was Earth some years ago. And then Earth got prettier. And I said I'd explain. Well, the reason Earth got prettier, and it's, it's no longer this sort of mosaic texture, is that within our team, we also have another product called Google Earth Engine. It's an online geospatial analysis platform that allows us to leverage Google's cloud to basically analyze large amounts of data, in this case, imagery from the Landsat satellite. Landsat is the longest running Earth observation satellite in the world. It's been constantly giving us pictures of Earth since 1972. And what Earth Engine allowed us to do was process this imagery into what we call pretty Earth. Now, this is a beautiful picture, but something's missing. What's missing from this image? Cloud. Clouds. And there's a reason for that, because the way this processing works is we actually took a whole bunch of images and we stack them, basically we match them up pixel to pixel and then we kick out the bad pixels and the bright white cloudy pixels and we effectively produce a composite image. So whilst this is a real image of the world, it's not a one-shot real image of the world. Now with that in mind, something else that's commonly asked is the idea that is Google Earth real time? You know, and it's not. It, you know, we've maybe seen on Star Trek where Spock goes in with his tricorder and does this instant scan of the planet and he's got this like model and all the information he needs. Um, not happening. Neither is, uh, is it real 
and this is for the sci-fi geeks. There was a, a book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. This is also, along with the tricorder and the powers of ten, often cited as one of the influences behind Google Earth. Uh, in Snow Crash, which by the way is famous for bringing us to the terms metaverse and avatar, first place they were used, uh, there's an application called Earth, which is real time. In Snow Crash's Earth, you could go outside and write, hi mom, in big letters, and then instantly see it. You could actually watch yourself writing it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen. However, wait long enough, it will show up in Google Earth. Google Earth is also not censoring your data. Okay, we're, we're not trying to hide anything in there. Um, oh, and it got cut off. Should be one more word here. We're not trying to censor any of these things or your house. Okay? This is a question, we probably the question we get the most, which is why is my house blurry? All the neighbors are good, you know, and then it cuts off and my house is blurry. And and I have to tell people, well, it's because we hate you. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, it's not at all, it's just luck. Sometimes there's a bad stitch, sometimes the capture just ends there. Sometimes there is censorship, but it's not Google. It's the laws of that country around the use of imagery that are being followed. And uh, for those of you that were here at uh, Chris Riley's talk at the start of the series, you would have heard more about that. Um, however, I will make an exception to that. There is one thing that we, we censor. We censor a certain uh, provider of fried chicken. <laughs> this is not deliberate. This is actually uh, just our face recognition blurring in street view getting a little frisky. In fact, my challenge to you is to find one of these establishments where the kernel is not blurred out. So, <laughs> it happens. But I mentioned Chris Riley, and uh, I just put this up because there was something he said in his talk um, that uh, I maybe don't 100% agree with, um, and, and that's because things have changed. He said that Google Earth is not really a primary focus for Google. And that has been true today um, because of the many issues that we've described. But with it becoming a web application that is changing, for example, it's now an additional service on what we call G Suite. G Suite is our Google Docs and all that online stuff. What that means, it's available for schools to use. Um, it works on Chromebooks. Education is one of the areas uh, that we're really putting a focus on. He also uh, made this point here, that Earth is for exploration, as we've talked about, correct, and fun. Maps is for getting around, it's functional. Uh, we actually sort of state this a little bit differently. We like to say that Maps is for finding your way, Google Earth is for getting lost. <laughs> now, next I want to show a video. I, I typically sh save this to the end, but we've uh, hopefully got some better stuff lined up for them. Um, but I didn't want to leave this out just because it's kind of one of the favorite videos I show, and it's just sort of an inspirational view of how far we've come in Google Earth and around this concept of exploration. <coughs> We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. Yet, the more I've experienced, the more I've learned that no matter how far we travel, or how fast we get there, the most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us, woven into the threads that bind us. All of us. So everything you saw there was captured through Google Earth and Street View. What was the title of that YouTube? 
Uh, it's actually just an internal thing that they let me show for talks. It, you can't find it on YouTube. So. Uh, so with this idea of exploration, we come to this goal. Now, I was invited uh, a couple of months ago to give a talk to the leadership of Parks Canada. It's kind of like the uh, National Park Service of Canada. And they wanted me to talk about trends in technology. And uh, I came across this image. And uh, I found it very poignant. I actually have very mixed emotions about this picture. Because you can look at it this two ways. On the one side, it's great that he has this technology is able to connect and share. On the other side, it's like, dude, stop looking at your phone and stare at the amazing landscape. <laughs> and, and, you know, we'll maybe give him a benefit of doubt. Let's, let's assume he's using Earth or Maps and he's not just on social media. But let's assume he's given him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe what he's trying to do is find out where, he's at, where he is. He's asking, where am I? Where is home? Now, for me, the answer to those questions are very much wrapped up into the history of Google Earth. Now, you, you have my bio, you may or may not read it, um, so I may skip through this section a little quickly, but uh, people often like to know how you get to do what you're doing and how it relates. And for me, as I say, it very much relates to Google Earth. So I grew up in England. Uh, I'm actually kind of a half and half. I spent my childhood in England, but I've spent my 95% of my adult life in the US, uh, mostly in Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, I live for the last 20 years, Hawaii, Alaska, the last few years in California. Um, prior to that, though, uh, I went to school in Canterbury in England, uh, well, partly in Canterbury, partly at Penn State University, and I was a physics major, physics and space science. I used to do things like dropping uh, flight spares, this is from the, uh, if you've heard of the Huygens mission, uh, Huygens probe on the Cassini mission. These were the flight spares of the first thing that touched down on Titan, which uh, I got to test, which basically means I took this oversized wash and I dropped it into gravel. But it sounds cooler if you say what it's used for. Uh, but what doing that led me to was an understanding that I was really interested in understanding surfaces and landscapes. And so when I went to grad school in Hawaii, I went, uh, I wanted to look at dynamic landscapes. So I, I went to study volc volcanology using remote sensing, using satellite images to understand why volcanic landscapes are the way they are, both before, during, and post eruption. So I got to study in some great places like the Philippines, and this is in Chile. Uh, I also would go to Italy every summer with a professor and work on Mount Etna using infrared cameras to look at lava flows, amongst other things. And this is where I met a professor from Alaska called John Dean, who at the time I was a master's student, but he promised me a postdoc when I was finished with my PhD. And he uh, was true to his words. So in 2005, I moved to Alaska, to Fairbanks, so I moved from Hawaii to 190 miles south of the Arctic Circle. Once again, kids, don't do this. No, I'm kidding. Uh, just, it, it was a bit of a change. But uh, also what was a bit of a change was what I went up to do. Initially, the idea of the project I was working on was looking at detection algorithms for volcanic hotspots. But uh, within a month or two of arriving, we attended this lecture where this guy was using this tool called Google Earth to fly around volcanoes in Kachaka. And we were just awestruck. And John said to me, he's like, dude, go play with this. <laughs> and so that's what I kind of did for the next uh, five years. Uh, we developed ways of using Google Earth to visualize our data, um, to look at you know, ongoing eruptions, to be part of our monitoring system. And I'm not going to get into the details. If you're interested, uh, you can actually find me on the web. If you look for Tech Talk, vol vol uh, Virtual Volcanology, this was a talk I gave on campus at Google over a decade ago now. Uh, full disclosure, I've never watched the video myself. <laughs> I, I kind of wasn't so good at presenting back then, um, but you can tell it's old. I've got hair and everything. Uh, <laughs> And you can learn about all the things that we, uh, we used to do. This was, in fact, about my fourth visit to Google. 
Uh, previously, well, our first one was almost two years before that, where we'd gone down and we'd met with a brand new engineer on the Google Earth team, uh, who, by the way, is now my director. And we developed a relationship because we showed her the stuff we were doing. And we, at the time, she was running the layers in Google Earth. And, and we said to Rebecca, well, look, these layers you've got for volcanoes, they're not very good. This is how we can improve them. And so we helped them work with the Smithsonian, who are sort of librarians of volcanology, to produce what's called the volcano layer in Google Earth. Maybe many of you have seen this. This was the original science layer, layer in Google Earth. Uh, and on the basis of this becoming very popular and successful, I kind of developed a reputation of being a sort of concierge of science for the Google Earth team. And, and for the science community, I was the way in to speak to Google. So I acted as this middleman and built a whole postdoc around it. We got Google coming to conferences, uh, you know, we got them involved in the scientific community. And kind of, you know, long story short, uh, fast forward to 2013, I by then was uh, an assistant professor, decided I was done with academia, quit, and uh, Google found out and they started recruiting me because they were looking for someone to help run their education, Google Earth education program. So it all worked out. Um, I actually, it was in fact, it was my last day at the university. I was six hours from unemployment when Google called me and offered me the job. <laughs> <laughs> it looks seamless on the resume, but there were a few sleepless nights. Uh, I still get to do a little bit of volcanology. Uh, this was a paper that came out last year with uh, a friend and colleague at Oregon State University. Uh, what's nice about this is it, it uses that Chile project that you already saw pictures of. And what's even cooler is that work that we did, and I did back in the day, hasn't really been used so much in the volcanology community. It has, however, been used a lot in the Mars community. Because what they're finding is that these surfaces on Mars are actually the, like these volcanic provinces that we studied in Chile. So for me, it's kind of come full circle. I started you know, working on planetary projects, and now my work is being used to study Mars. So that's kind of fun. But uh, to mention that, I'll show you something more about the Chile project. I asked at the beginning what the first thing you did in Google Earth was. And uh, most of you said house, look at your house. For me, I actually didn't look at my house at the beginning. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. One, I already looked at satellite imagery. It wasn't kind of a new thing to me. Also, by 2005, I had lived in approximately 25 different houses, so really wouldn't know which one to choose. Uh, but my aha moment was after I made this. Now this is that landscape in Chile that I, I worked on. This isn't made using Google Earth. I made this a year before Google Earth came out. It took me a week to manually kind of make that DM, drape the imagery over, make that little few second flyover. I was pretty proud of it. A year later, Google Earth came out. Same imagery, same DEM. You could make a fly for you like that in about 60 seconds. And that's what was, was when I suddenly went, wow, this stuff has really got some potential and power. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, that there's this, this power of these imagery, you know, with these images. Now, I mentioned earlier we were going to talk about Street View. This is my favorite ever Street View image. If you're not familiar with Street View, this is the 360 camera. Uh, actually, it's a series of cameras. There's 15 of them in there that look in multiple directions, capture images simultaneously, and stitch into one seamless view. Think of it as being in the center of a giant bubble when you look around, you can see all around. I said the monkey is my second favorite image. Uh, this is my favorite image. Uh, this is a project I was lucky enough to play a very small role in launching last year. This is Street View on the space station. Once again, this is my world all coming together. Um, however, I still love the monkeys. I mean, it's monkeys in a hot tub. How can you not like it? It's awesome. But let's think about this image. Let's, let's look at the monkeys. And what, what I need you to do, I need you to get into the mind of 
<laughs> what is it the monkey is thinking? <laughs> the point is, there's more information than you might think in images, the, the more you look. Let me give you a, a practical example of this. Now, um, when I first arrived in uh, Google, one of the things I wanted to be involved in was the Street View uh, imagery and, and, and collecting the Street View imagery. So, uh, you know, I agreed to do some, you know, really awful tasks like going to the Galapagos and chasing after giant tortoises. It's horrible, you know, working conditions. Yeah. No, it's, this was amazing. So I think forever be one of my career highlights uh, because I got to go climb volcanoes with the Trekker backpack, um, which by the way, isn't cool as it looks in the photos. It's just heavy and overbalanced. But we won't get into that this time. Uh, he's up there. I don't know if he's 300. I would give him at least 150 to 2. Um, he was a big boy. Where is that at? So this is Alcedo Volcano. Good question. In fact, rather than just tell you... Because I never knew where they all hung, hung out like that. Either. Yeah. So, uh, so the blue, when we go, go to Google Earth, we click on our little yellow friends down here, Pegman. The blue line comes up. And the blue line is everywhere that we have imagery. So if I click on that line, we're going to go down and we can see That's Google Map, or is that this is Street View. That was Google Earth into Street View. How do you say that? Street? Street, Street View. So the 360 degree images that we can look all around. Now you can see there's plenty of tortoises there, but I actually want to go to this view. What do you notice about this image in regards to the tortoises? It is, well, because it's on my back. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think I heard it at the back there. You said, someone said there's a path. Yeah. Where did the path come from? The tortoises made the path. Wow. Now, if they're making a path, that might mean that they must be traveling the same route. And in fact, I have a little visualization that shows this. Now, the scientists there, they, and this, by the way, doesn't harm them. They mount little radio transmitters and data loggers on the back of tortoises. So they're able to track their, ha their patterns of movement. And what they find is the tortoises, they migrate around this whole volcanic rim, down into the crater, along the backside, for feeding, for mating, and all these things. But they always end up coming back to this one spot. This they, one spot on the rim. Is that a mating spot? It's not a mating spot, a good guess. Why else do you think they'll come back here? Fresh food. Another good guess? Not quite there. I'm going to maybe give you a little clue here. What is this? It's a water tank. So, a little bit of backstory here. This is a hut that was built by the goat catchers or killers, I guess. Oh, hunters, I guess is the word. So, these tortoises you're looking at, the Alceo tortoises, almost died out. They were down to a few dozen. And that's because there were goats everywhere that were killing the eggs and the young and the, and the food. And so they decided to eradicate the goats. It took them many years. And, and the hunters would have to go up there and stay in this pretty basic uh, rat-infested hut. But in order to survive there, they needed water. So they had to capture rainwater, hence tanks. Now, this hut is still used by scientists. All the goats are gone and the, the tortoises are flourishing. But they still need water, so they put these tanks out to collect water. Because this part of the volcanic crater, or volcanic rim, is where the air flows the clouds over, or where the air comes over, condenses into clouds. So there's always water on this part of the volcano. The tortoises can go for months without food, but even they need water like humans in a much shorter time span. So what's fun about this is there's water around, but they also know that there's a lot of water here. So when you stay here, when you wake up in the morning, it's like a scene out of a zombie movie. There's these tortoises all around the fence trying to get in. And, uh, and sometimes they get in and you have to chase them down, which isn't very hard because you know. But, uh, but then you have to pick them up, which is a whole different ball game. 
Because if they get in, what they will do not do is not the tap off the uh, tanks, lap up some water, but it will flow out. There's nothing there for the scientists, for the scientists. But anyway, the point of all this is that just from the images, from that simple image of the pathway, there was a deeper story to understanding what was going on here. Let me give you another example. Now there we had lines, and we're referring back to images. But what if we just have points on a map? Now we're using a, a tool here called My Maps. In fact, let's just go into My Maps. And sort of left to their own devices, these are just points on a map. What do they mean? Well, start out by telling you the red place marks represent where all of my Facebook friends live. So I made a big spreadsheet and then uploaded it to my maps, which automatically geocoded to the locations of my friends. And so let's try and understand the pattern here. Let's start, let's turn on yellow uh, stars. These are the places I live. So immediately certain patterns, and you can't really see how many are stacked in these locations make sense. So let's actually, I'm going to change the style here to style by, oh, not here, sorry. I'm going to change here to style by country, because this is going to give us a little more information. <coughs> It'll tell us, OK, plenty in the US, England, makes sense, Canada, um, Australia. What's the deal with Japan? Why, why do I know a bunch of people in Japan? Well, in order to answer that question, we, we need to think about some of these other outliers. In Japan's case, this person here, Adam. So Adam was a friend of mine for over 20 years. Uh, about a few weeks ago, one year ago, Adam unfortunately died of cancer. Uh, six months later, he saved my life. So my last conversation with Adam, uh, he, uh, he basically was, I took him to his uh, chemo session and he was berating me to go and make sure I got a checkup. And because uh, my dad had died of cancer a few years ago. So, of course, life gets busy. I hadn't done it. But then, earlier this, uh, this uh, earlier last year in the summer, I felt what was like a swollen gland. And the first voice in my head was Adam's. And so I went to the doctors. And the doctor sent me for an MRI. And it turned out I had a very, very rare form of tumor around my carotid artery. Uh, very rare because it, uh, what's unique about it is, is it's around the carotid artery, so it, it grows and eventually chokes the blood and oxygen going to your brain, which I'm told is medically a bad thing. So, uh, but the thing is, it's totally painless. Until it starts doing the choking, it's totally symptomless. So usually these things aren't found until very late on. Uh, and and uh, as I say, they're very rare, about 50 cases a year in the country. Um, I, because of Adam's voice in my head, found this at the first stage and had it removed this fall. And uh, actually, this is my first kind of public lecture since then. So, so the point of that, though, is that it looks like dots on a map. But if you start to dive in the meaning and the stories behind those maps, it's more than that. There's a narrative there. You could tell the narrative of my life based on these points on a map. So this is a potentially very powerful tool. But in order to leverage it, you need a little bit of guidance, like me telling you the stories behind these points. So this is something that we're doing in Google Earth. So there's a feature here, this ship's wheel, called Voyager. And if we open up Voyager, what this is, it's this idea of geospatial storytelling, bringing together images, videos, points, lines on the map into a storytelling narrative. And I just, uh, I want to show you a few examples of this. So we've been going with this idea of home, and uh, one of the, the best, if not the best thing in Voyager is this. This is where we've uh, worked with people all around the world to capture what it's like to live 
in different native environments. For example, have you ever wondered what it's like to be in a house made of reeds on Lake Titicaca? So we can fly down, we can see that, and then in fact, you can go in and see the house from the outside. We have the street view imagery here, and then we can even go inside the house itself. Now in contrast, we could then say go up to Canada. You can pretty much make your own history books doing this for the future. Well, our idea is not to make the books or the history or even the lessons, but from the education angle, we certainly we want to augment those lessons and provide tools that teachers can integrate into the classroom. That's a big part of what the I do. Pictures, you mean the addition of the pictures? Yeah, or just this experience. You know, you're talking about maybe Native Americans and Inuits tribes but you know it's hard even through flat pictures to really understand what an igloo is like but what if you could do this what if you could go inside that igloo and just see what it's like to live in that environment mm -hmm. now for example so <coughs> Here, that was, example was very much sort of embedded in the use of the imagery. Here, we're making more of a use of the images and text and videos that come here and can appear in the sidebar here. So this is David Attenborough, a very famous uh, TV animals guy. And I want to play this video. What's his name again? David Attenborough. Kenya. You may know. So it's big cats. So it starts off with his wonderful narration, and we're going to actually, in the interest of time, skip forward. Basically, there's a cheetah and an ostrich, so you probably know how this is going to go down. Then suddenly, there are three. Now what I like about this is up to this point you think you know the story. There's a cheetah, there's an ostrich, the cheetah's chasing the ostrich, blah blah blah. However, let's consider the ostrich's viewpoint. Now at this point the ostrich knows he's not escaping that cheetah. However, he also realizes he doesn't need to. He just and needs to run faster than the cheetah. And the cheetah switched up. And we'll pause it there because this is a family show and I think you know how this ends. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the point is, again, stories within stories. Stories within narratives. I'll show you one more example. I know we're, uh, we're pushing the time a little bit here. Now, this is a, uh, a Voyager story that was made by Partners of the Merakian, which is the Tokyo Science Museum. Amazing place if you ever go to Tokyo. It's one of my favorite museums in the world. Uh, but it's about the different planets around the world. Now you can say, well, how is that possible? This is Google Earth, you don't have other planets in there. And you're right, we don't. You can find them on Google Maps, not on Google Earth right now. Uh, but what it is, is they take the planet and they take a feature that's sort of uh, notable for that planet. In this case, Mercury has a lot of craters. And they find what we call a terrestrial analogy or equivalent. So there we're talking about uh, craters. For Mars, they do a comparison of volcanoes. So the, uh, the biggest volcano on Earth is Mauna Kea. And it's tiny though, compared to Olympus Mons, which is the biggest volcano on Mars. Mm. And so I, I really love what they did with this story here. I think it's a, a very kind of unique way of comparing these things. So, three different examples there. Sometimes it's about the imagery, sometimes it's about sort of augmentation of the imagery, points and lines, sometimes it's both. Um, sometimes all these things come together and it's about the location, which kind of brings us to the theme of the gap. So this is also in Voyager. This is Saru's story, and so you can explore his story, and again, they've, they've done a very kind of unique job where they've broken this up into stops. 
And so you can progress along and you can see the different stops in his life, how he then had the challenge of all these different railroads, how he defined his search area. I'm not going to show you the, the whole thing there because you can explore that for yourself. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the perks that we have at Google is that uh, people come to visit. In this case, Saru came to visit. Um, this is Deb Patel who's playing him in the movie. And uh, this is Luke Davies, the, the screenwriter. This is Gopal, uh, who's the product manager for Google Earth and who actually worked with Saru and the film crew at Lion um, to do the Google Earth stuff in the movie. Uh, some things that you maybe don't even realize, when you see him using Google Earth in the movie, he's using the version that matches that year. So when he first started, there was one version of Google Earth, and by the time he finished his quest, there was a different version. Uh, there were just great, some great subtle things like that that I did. Now, we, we got to ask some rude questions. So, you know, I asked him, if he could go back in time and change one thing about Google Earth, what would it be? Um, and it, his response was, you know, kind of like your response to why is my house blurry? It's like, well, I wish there'd been better images earlier. But then he kind of stopped and he thought about it and, and he sort of took an approach that in many ways, what was meant to be happened. You know, it, it, in maybe he was meant to take this quest, to take this exploration, to find a home and the, the, there were no shortcuts and the fact that the images weren't so good back then was just part of the process. Um, and I think it, it almost made him appreciate everything more, you know, appreciate the home that he came from, the home that he has in Australia. Um, and if you read his book, that really is the theme when it comes down to it. It's about home. <coughs> And that's really what this talk was about. And in many ways, what Google Earth is about. I started with a question, you know, what's the first thing that you do in Google Earth? You look for your house, you look for your home. Google Earth is this tool that allows us to, to look at our home, and our home being the world, this great planet that we have, and to explore it and to learn about it, and hopefully maybe to do some things about being good stewards of it. That's kind of our goal on the Google Earth, on the Google Earth Outreach team. So um, hopefully we've inspired you to do that. Thank you. Yes? What was the original intent for Google Earth by Google, the company? Where were they thinking they would take this and and so on. And I, I imagine it went to a lot of different directions that they had. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question is, what was the original intent for Google? Um, <coughs> first buying and then releasing Google Earth. Well, Keyhole, the original uh, pro, uh, product, um, original company, was actually uh, somewhat funded by the CIA. It had military applications. Now, when we bought that, that wasn't obviously our goal. Um, as opposed to what our goal was, um, sometimes we don't have one. There's, there's actually a great story about uh, Larry and Sergey were in the leadership meeting uh, when they first like, were showing off this technology and people were like, fighting to enter their address and see their house. And they were just like, this is too cool, we need to have it. Um, it was also the same year that we, we bought a couple of technologies that led to Google Maps. So we were thinking about that mapping digital world, but I'm not sure we, we necessarily knew where we were going to go with it. We just knew that there was, it, it, it was something that the world needed, it felt like. Yes? Question. When you were showing about how I am, you know, the image of Africa, how it became prettier, mm. um, you said like it's overlays. Is there something like the progression of the Sahara Desert or something like that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I've been showing all sort of New Earth. I haven't shown Classic Earth. And the one reason we still have both is that uh, Classic Earth has a bunch of features we haven't implemented in New Earth yet. Uh, one of the big ones is the ability to make and view and create your own content. Uh, you, know, you know, the points and lines of polygons. You can view that in New Earth. You can't just, you can't make it yet. And a couple of the other, or one of the other big ones is in Classic Earth, 
we have an historical archive of imagery where you can scroll back and see old images. And so, uh, if you were to scroll back and look at the old images, you'd actually get to a view that's that sort of mosaic looking, uh, almost like a patchwork quilt. And that's because we didn't have these great ways of processing and doing what we call uh, color matching and stitching in a way that makes it look so seamless. So you could use the historical imagery to see the progression of the Sahara or some of the classic ones of deforestation in the rainforest, um, some other things like that. But, and, and we have this, not just in the historical imagery, we actually have it, show you really quickly. We have it in a, in a tool called Time Lapse, which is another project of this. Um, It will go, well, yes and no. Let, let me answer that in one second. I just want to show this. Um, so this again is using the Earth Engine technology to show change over time. Um, try and find some uh, good examples here. So they're going to keep the old images so you can... We, we have, you know, we, we own these images. We're not going to get rid of them. Um, we're using them for projects like this so you can look through them. But awesome. uh, to answer this lady's question, yes. So you, you can type coordinates, but you don't need coordinates. You can type a place name. Um, now obviously some place names, if you type Springfield and you're located over the US, you're probably going to get a bunch of different options. Did you say if you type in the word Springfield, you're going to get a whole other picture? You're going to get a bunch of options of where to go to, because there's lots of Springfields. Um, likewise, if you're, say you're positioned over you know, the Bay Area, and you type in Great Wall of China, you're probably going to get the locations of Chinese restaurants as opposed to flying to the Great Wall of China. So part of it is based on your view, so part of it is what you're typing. If I typed in China, Great Wall, something like that, it would go there. Well, let's just test all these theories. So, uh, so all of this sort of uh, came about what we can view through airplanes, right? People come going, driving over and, and all that kind of stuff? Uh, kind of. I mean, before we had satellite, high resolution satellite imagery, there was aerial photography. Um, and back before we, again, we had better processing of the imagery, uh, then the original sort of old imagery in Earth would use some of that. I can fire this up quickly to show you. I know we've run way over time, so don't feel bad if you didn't leave. If you have to go, please uh, do, but I'm happy to carry on answering questions. So what I've been talking about is historical imagery here. So if you turn on this, you see that we can go all the way back to 1930. Now, obviously, we don't have imagery back from 1930. But let's try and pick someone there, like 1959. See a little square appeared? That's some of this old panchromatic, i.e. gray, aerial photography. So some of the first, if you like, high resolution, captured from above imagery that we have. So there's this whole archive. But then when you see, you see these very uh, regimented breaks here, and in fact, if we click through them, what you're going to find is it's all going to be every year in December. That's because these are these composite images that I talked about. These are the images that make up that time lapse that you're seeing here. So time lapse is a project where we took every Landsat image from 1984 onwards. And when I say every image, I, I mean we didn't just take one a month or one a year, we took every image, over five million images, stacked them all together, for each year made one of these composite images and then mosaic them across the world through space and time. Now, to give you the idea of, of the power that requires, if you had your own supercomputer at home and you did this, tried doing this, your grandkids' grandkids would be dead before you finished. We did it in a day and a half because we were running 66,000 machines in parallel over 2 million computing hours uh, for this, uh, what was it, 909 terabytes of data. Uh, that was just the first version. There's spreadsheet pictures, right? 
Yeah, what, sorry? Uh, if this is an okay way to say it, spread it, sheet, pictures, photos, that you just place together and... and yeah, well, I mean, a satellite image is just ones and zeros at the end of the day. But if you think of it as not really a spreadsheet, but an array is a correct way of thinking about it. And so you can, you can match them up. So, yeah, the idea of cells is the right way of thinking, correct? But, uh, all right. Any other questions? Yeah, John. Uh, yeah, cool. So what's your advice to um, kids and to uh, someone interested in working... Becoming a scientist in Google or working for Google. What's your, what well, I mean, as you saw from my history, it was, it was never really a plan. Um, actually, ironically, uh, in high school, uh, I told my mom two things in high school. Um, my mom used to be a teacher. I said, one, I'm never teaching. And, uh, and two, I'm not interested in these new computer things. So, because they're useless. Uh, so she finds it more than a little ironic in my current role at Google. Um, I mean, the, the advice is uh, just take advantage of like exploring and learning. Um, take computer classes if you, if you really want to work for Google or someone like it. Learning to program, while it's not 100% necessity, is very, very useful. Um, you, you're going to have to stay in school a while, it's going to require at least a bachelor's. Uh, some of us spent longer, we didn't really want to enter the real world, but uh, that's okay too. So, um, really just, um, you know, the, the thing about Google and the way we hire is it's not about someone having particular knowledge or background. It's about having certain skill sets and a way of kind of viewing things and viewing the world. And so, really take the approach that, that sort of there's a lot to learn out there and just try and uh, ingest that knowledge as much as you can.